Okay, let's take a look at this week's questions. Why is the Gettysburg Address so short? A number of groups chose this question. Most people had a similar idea, which is if it's a short speech, it's easier to grab the main point. It's easier for the audience to remember a shorter speech than a longer speech, and this is true. But we should also remember that Lincoln did not tell people he was going to give a short speech. It was it, to everybody else. It looked like a regular politician going up on stage and preparing to talk for three hours. So when Lincoln stopped talking, everybody was very surprised. And so in terms of remembering the speech, this makes a difference. Like this class, you guys are prepared to listen to me talk for like 45 minutes, right? But if I blew through these five questions in 10 minutes, your memory would work in a different way also. Your brain, part of your brain would be working to comprehend the fact that I'm going so fast, and the other part of your brain would have to adjust. So when the audience is prepared for like a three hour speech and they only get five minutes, how much do they really remember? If they were expecting this to be the beginning of the beginning of the introduction, and it turns into the whole speech, how much do they remember? Uh, in fact, Lincoln himself had a little trouble remembering the speech. If you read the footnote, uh, it says the source of the text printed here is the facsimile, which means copy, reproduced in this book, Lincoln at Gettysburg from 1930. So apparently what happened was Lincoln kind of wrote his speech by hand on the train journey uh, going to Gettysburg. He read the speech and then he kind of lost the paper. And so when the speech became famous and newspapers wanted to reprint his speech. He couldn't exactly remember the words that he used, and so he kind of rewrote a similar speech for the newspapers, and that is the speech that we're reading. It's not exactly what Lincoln said, so even Lincoln himself had a little trouble remembering this speech afterwards. But for us readers, it is true. When you see such a short speech, it is easier for us to remember. Are there other reasons? One group mentioned that um, making a longer speech would actually hurt the goal of the speech. According to this group, the purpose of this speech is to provide comfort to people who have lost family members in this battle or in the Civil War. And the way that Lincoln offers comfort is by trying to give these deaths meaning. So we can take a look at the text. Uh, it says, um, it is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. So he's saying these soldiers died here for a reason, and we have to help them accomplish their mission. And what is that mission? He goes on to say that uh, it's to help the U.S. have a new birth of freedom and to preserve government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So Lincoln is trying to give meaning to these soldiers' deaths uh, in order to offer comfort to their family. If he said more than this, if maybe he listed some political points or he tried to issue a call for action asking people to continue supporting him, According to this group, it would make this speech less of a comfort 
and more of a political speech. It would go against the purpose of the speech. So if Lincoln only needed to say these words to achieve his goal, then there's no reason to make it a longer speech. Finally, one more reason I heard from a group is here. In a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. What he's saying is nothing I can say will make this place more important than what the soldiers have fought for here already. The fact that our brave young men fought and died here makes this place very important and nothing I can say can make it even more important. So wouldn't it be hilarious if after he says nothing I can say could help, he then goes on to talk for three hours? All right, that wouldn't make sense, right? He already said nothing I can say will make this place more important. So he very wisely decides not to say too much. And so by following his own logic, he adds to the power of this speech. Some politicians, they'll begin by saying, I'll say a few words, and then they talk for three hours. And, you know, the longer this kind of person talks, I don't know about you, but the angrier I get. You said a few words, not a few thousand words. Uh, but when Lincoln says, there's nothing more I can say, he really doesn't say a lot. And that um, it adds to his reputation. He's called Honest Abe. He says it like it is. Makes him more trustworthy. Uh, it makes the people listening trust him more as president and as leader of the Northern Army. Which brings us into question two. He is the leader of the northern half of the United States. So when he talks about the soldiers who fought and died there, do you think he includes the southern soldiers, the enemy, as well? Two groups took this question and they both say yes for the same reason. Um, because the North was the original U.S. government, right? The Confederacy in the South broke away from the U.S. So technically, Lincoln was still president of the entire United States, just as technically Lai Qingde is president of all of China, right? Same logic. So if Lincoln's goal is to try to reunify the U.S., like to welcome the southern half back into the country, then it would not make sense for him to exclude the southern soldiers. Everybody knows that soldiers don't kill people because they want to. They kill people because their government orders them to. So it makes no sense to uh, say beautiful words about the northern soldiers and then completely ignore the southern soldiers simply because they happen to live in the southern part of the country and their government forced them to fight. It would not help the cause of national unity. Um, or, or as one of these two groups m mentioned, Lincoln is trying to be president to all Americans, no matter the government. Now, some people might think, but he is the president of the northern half. It would be unfair to the northern union if he treated north and south the same. And I agree, which is and so does Lincoln. So this is why Lincoln spoke at a place where the northern soldiers were buried. He sent a message through his choice of location. He welcomes the southern half back into the country, but he is still president of the northern half. Especially for politics, 
symbolism is very important. Question three, so we're moving into the second speech. Why does Douglas quote from the Bible so much? This was today's most popular question. Um, so like it's not a long selection, but even in the footnotes, right? Footnote two, this quotation is from the Bible. And then footnote three, it's a paragraph from the Bible. Uh, and then um, even throughout the entire speech, there are some places where he makes a quick reference or a quick quotation, uh, or even just straight up mentions the Bible. So why? Why does he do this? Well, um, most groups agreed that he does this because he thinks that it will help make his speech better. Why? Well, we can think about his audience. I think most of, or even all of his audience were Christians. Christians, of course, are people who believe in God, in Jesus, and believe in the Bible. So when Douglas is saying the Bible tells us slavery is bad, and you're Christians who believe in the Bible, why aren't you working so hard to fight slavery? Are you not real Christians? Do you not follow what your religion tells you? It's making them personally feel like they should work harder to fight slavery. One group even mentioned that um, not just the Bible, not just the abstract idea of religion, but the idea of there being a God or a Jesus who is with you every day. You go to church to worship him every Sunday. Like this is not just an idea, right? Like uh, even most people in Taiwan who are not Christians believe that if you are a bad person, you will go to hell, some kind of hell. But that's just an idea. You don't think about it every day. But for Christians in the 19th century, they did think about God every day. They prayed in the morning. They pray before eating. They go to church every They pray before bed. They go to church every Sunday. After dinner, sometimes they will read from the Bible as a kind of moral instruction. Christianity at that time was part of daily life. It's not just when somebody is about to die or just every Sunday. So if they truly believe that they were Christians, then Douglas is saying you should follow the Bible, right? And the Bible says slavery is bad. So why are you still allowing slavery in this country? It makes his argument personal. Um, and if you're not a Christian or other kind of uh, similar religious faith, you may not understand this very deeply, but the idea of a transcendent religion, the idea that there is an external God somewhere in the universe who knows everything and hopefully loves you, is a very, it's a very powerful idea. It's like your human father will one day grow old and die. No matter how much you love him, no matter how much he loves you. But God the Father will always be there for you. It's a very powerful idea. So when Douglas quotes from the Bible, he's using this idea. If you believe in this entire religious system, you believe that God will always be there for you, you believe that you should obey and follow God. Why are you still letting slavery exist in this country? I mean, the U.S. says there's a separation between church and state. But when they wrote that in the Constitution, when they were talking about church, they were not talking about different kinds of religion. They were talking about different kinds of Christianity. Are you a Catholic? Are you a Protestant? 
if you're Protestant, are you Congregationalist? Are you Unitarian? Are you Presbyterian? Are you Baptist? Are you Methodist? Different kinds of Christianity. The people who wrote the US Constitution could not or did not imagine that there would be Americans who did not believe in Jesus. In fact, one of the earliest, let's call it other religions in US history was Mormonism, Mormon Jao, who believed in Jesus, yes, but they also believed in somebody after Jesus. And for a long time, the US government tried to shut down Mormonism. So when the US government says separation of church and state in this time period, they were not thinking about different religions. They were thinking about different kinds of Christianity. In fact, the official motto of the US today is still in God we trust. It's printed on their money. So yes, today, according to US law, there is religious freedom, but in terms of culture, the US is still a Christian country. And so when Douglas quotes the Bible in support of anti-slavery efforts, he's basically saying, how can this be a Christian country if it allows slavery when the Bible says that slavery is bad? He's essentially attacking the very foundational values of the United States. Uh, and this is something that only religion possibly could do. Like even if you talked about like to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all of the foundational political values of the US, different people can disagree about how to achieve those political values. But if everybody is some kind of Christian and everybody reads and believes in the Bible, the difference of interpretation is very minor. When the Bible clearly has statements about how bad slavery is, it's very hard to get any other kind of conclusion other than slavery is bad. So it really is a, a powerful addition to his argument in the 19th century. Maybe less powerful today. Question four, he, when he says that scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed to oppose slavery, do you agree? Why or why not? The three groups that took this question all agreed with Douglas. Uh, let's take a closer look. This question, the answer is actually in the speech. Uh, let's see, page 24. Two paragraphs from the bottom. So here he has imagined some people will say, oh, I would oppose slavery, but only if you make a good argument. Otherwise, why should I follow you? So here is his response. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Republicans here means people who support the government of the US, not people from the Republican Party. The Republican Party was started basically at around the time of Lincoln. So this is 1853. There was no Republican Party yet. Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation? as a matter beset with great difficulty, like it's hard to think about, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice? Is it hard to connect the idea of slavery and the idea of justice? Is it hard to be understood? The answer to all of these questions, of course, is no, right? Everybody with a thinking mind agrees that slavery is bad. He, he tells us this, uh, here, if he does present arguments, 
to do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding, your mind. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. There are two ideas in this last sentence. First, everybody agrees that slavery is wrong. But second, everybody agrees that slavery is wrong because they themselves don't want to be slaves. It's wrong for himself. So then the question is not, is slavery bad? The question then becomes, everybody agrees slavery is bad, so why is slavery still here? And Douglas's answer is in those two words, for him, for yourself. He's saying, you in the audience agree you would not want to be slaves. But then you don't say that, therefore, other people should not be slaves. The question then becomes not is slavery bad, but why should I care about other people? And to this, Douglas says, basically, there's only one way to make you care if you don't care. And that is by making you feel the argument. At a time like this, Scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. You already agree with my argument. You just won't follow the necessary actions. You agree that exercise every day is good for you. You just won't go exercise. So what more reason can I give you that would make you want to exercise? According to Douglas, nothing. I have to use irony. I have to make you feel that you should do this. You should exercise, or in this case, you should oppose slavery, not just intellectually, right? If somebody asks you, is slavery bad? You say yes, and then you don't do anything. But you should feel like you should work to stop slavery. So he says the best way is irony. Oh, had I the ability, if I had the ability, and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, like rain, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened, which means the nation must feel this argument, this purpose. The conscience of the nation must be roused, which means awakened. The propriety, which means justice, of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed, and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. So this tells us he thinks the point is now to make people feel the argument. Uh, and I think every group that took this question agrees. At this kind of situation, irony works much better than argument, reasonable argument. And in fact, what actually ended slavery was not even irony. It's not even public speaking speeches and newspaper editorials. It took a war to end slavery. So Douglas was correct. Arguments would not work. And question five. One group took this question. Um, I presented the two texts out of order. Douglas spoke in 1852 before the Civil War, and Lincoln spoke in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War. So here the question is asking, do you think Douglas would agree with Lincoln's speech? Remember, the Gettysburg Address is a speech that tries to give a unity of purpose to all of the dead soldiers and their families. 
and that unity of purpose. Let's go back. Comes at the very end of the speech. He's saying. These soldiers died here for a reason and the reason or for a purpose and the purpose is to give the US a new birth of freedom. And so that government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. So there are two points here. To make the US even more free. And to preserve democracy. Would Douglas have agreed with these two points? Uh, the group I talked with said yes and basically yes. So the first one, so that the US could be more free. Douglas, I'm sure, would agree with that. You have to have a United States before you can turn slaves into US citizens. Uh, so I'm sure Douglas would support this goal. The second part, to preserve democracy. To preserve democracy assumes that the US already is a democracy. I'm pretty sure Douglas agrees that democracy is a good thing, but maybe he would not agree so much that the US at that time was already a democracy. Perhaps he would have thought that the better way to say the second point is to give birth to a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and not just to preserve it. Because at the time, he may have thought it's not really a government of, by, and for the people if enslaved people are not part of it. So, uh, according to this group, Douglas may have supported Lincoln's ideals and values, but maybe would disagree with Lincoln about his understanding of the situation. Like, yes, we are going in the same direction, but we disagree about how far have we gone so far. Okay, do you have questions or other thoughts about today's discussion? OK, if not, I want to introduce next week's reading. Next week, we're going to read five poems. The poems we're going to read next week, two of them are by Walt Whitman, and three of them are by Emily Dickinson. These two are often considered the most important poets in American literature. Does that mean that they're good poets? Maybe. Taste is an individual choice, but they are important poets. The way that their poetry influenced American literature is undeniable. So let me talk about these two people. Walt Whitman was a gay man. This at a time when being gay was illegal. Um, but of course, in order to be locked up for being gay, people have to prove that you did gay things, and that's hard to prove. Um, so he was he had a reputation of being gay. But it also means that he is, let's say, different from most other poets of the time. He had a different perspective. He had a different reputation. And because of his difference, his main poetry project was to try to show that he is the perfect representation of everyday Americans. This might sound a bit strange. Because he is so special, he tried to show that he is an everyman, that everybody, he can represent everybody. His thoughts and feelings are what every American thinks and feels. If Let's say if I am not special, if I'm just another professor who, you know, I am just another professor, then if I say I represent all professors of English in Taiwan, you might say, no, no, 
your teacher was this person. You studied at this school. So in fact, you don't represent everybody. You just represent that side. But Whitman had no connections, had no specific background. He was unique. And so that gave him the space to say, in fact, because I am not connected to any one part of the country, I can represent everybody in my poetry. His most famous poetry collection is called Leaves of Grass, Ji, and he worked on this through his entire life. There are many, many, many editions, and each edition he added more and more poems. Sometimes he modified a poem, sometimes he cut a poem, but mostly he just kept adding. And it creates a sense that he really is trying to capture all of America, all kinds of American experience in his work. One part is about uh, his military experience. He worked as a nurse during the Civil War. Another part would be about city life. Another part would be about country life. And the goal was if you read the whole collection, you would understand the American experience, all different sides of it. Another way he tried to achieve this goal is in his poems. In fact, if you take a look at the second poem, Vigil Strange I Kept on the Field One Night, one thing you'll notice is that these lines are very long. When you read poetry and you see this kind of line, it's indented, right? This means it is actually part of the previous line. There's just not enough space on the page. So in fact, if you count lines, vigil is line one, when is line two, one is line three, and the second, this one is line four, and then is line five. So Whitman likes to use really long poetic lines. This is another part of his strategy. He say, like he, the idea is when you change lines intentionally, that adds a break between ideas or a pause between ideas. You are actually dividing your language into sections. But Whitman is trying to encompass everything. Even in his individual lines, he's saying, I'm going to put as much as I can in my poetry to show you that it's all connected and it's all part of the American experience. So in fact, if you read the language, it is also not condensed. The density is very low. The idea is again to really give you a sense of being part of this experience. So it's not like we are appreciating this poem across time and space, like we're looking at it at a, in a museum. We are actually living the poem alongside the poet. We are inside. We are part of this poem. That's the kind of effect that he was trying to create. So apart from his poetry, uh, Whitman was most famous for his Civil War memoirs. As I said, he worked as a nurse during the Civil War, and he wrote his memoirs about his experiences. Uh, and it's a very interesting perspective to have a poet who declares himself the poet of America write about his experience taking care of wounded soldiers in the Civil War, a war about the definition of America. Uh, and he's somehow able to take this war that separated the country and in his emotions and in his poetry, show compassion for everybody in the war. Uh, and this is also part of why he is known as such a, in, an important American poet. Not an important Northern poet, but an, an important American poet. So the, we're going to read two of his poems. It's actually not too easy to choose a some poems to read because his poems are usually very long. Uh, so I chose two shorter ones. When I heard the learned astronomer, 
uh, is a very it's it's unusually short, and it is about a single idea. Um, the difference between learning and experience, the difference between knowledge and experience. The second poem, Vigil Strange I Kept on the Field One Night. A vigil means to keep watch, so ho. And the field here means the battlefield. This poem is about when he's on the battlefield and he sees a soldier get shot lying on the ground. He spends all night accompanying this dying soldier. And he writes about this experience. Both of these poems are taken from some part of Leaves of Grass. Do you have questions about Walt Whitman? OK, if not, let's go to the next page. Let's talk about Emily Dickinson. You may have heard this name before. She has recently become very popular once again, thanks to an Apple TV limited series and two movies. Two, two or three movies. Emily Dickinson is a poet who was rarely published in her lifetime. She's famous for being an unmarried woman in Massachusetts who spent her entire life more or less in the same town. She was not a big traveler. She had she was in a very conservative family. Um, and she was also, by all accounts, quite shy. So in an opposite way to Whitman, Whitman, you know, traveled around. He tried to encompass all of America. Dickinson tried to go deep into the human mind. She wrote about her limited experiences in very unique perspectives. The way she thought about um, the spirit, human spirit, the way she thought about language, the way she thought about the idea of death is very special. And this makes her poetry sometimes not easy to understand. If you look at these lines, it looks more like traditional poetry, right? But then you'll notice two things. One, all of these dashes, even at the end of a sentence, right? All dashes. What do these dashes mean? This is one of the big questions of reading Dickinson's poetry. Why does she use dashes and not periods, not commas, not something more familiar? Uh, it could be a, some kind of spur to thinking. Right? It's, it's a way to include you in the poem. It could be a way to create uncertainty, to open up different ways of understanding. We can talk about this. I think this is part of my discussion questions. The second thing you'll notice if you start reading is that her poems, they almost rhyme. Today, victory, bells, tunes, means, balls. So today and victory almost rhyme. Bells and balls almost rhyme. Tunes and means almost rhyme. Stain again. Moan and stone rhyme. Eyes and surprise rhyme. And then you have like prayer in the middle. So her rhyme scheme is also very, this is called dissonant. Um, and it's for a similar reason as her punctuation. Why does she do this? Is it to create space for the reader? Is it to welcome us into the poem? Is it to make us think more? Is it to make us consider the similarities and the differences between words that almost rhyme? Um, all of these are possibilities. Now, you'll also notice that the poems are not titled. They have numbers. 
Dickinson only managed to publish a handful of poems in her lifetime, mostly because she wrote these strange poems that people did not know how to read. So newspapers either would not publish her or would change her poems without her permission. So in the end, she stopped trying and instead just collected her poetry. She wrote on small scraps of paper, both sides, and when she finished a poem, she would string it together into like a small book. And she put these books in a chest, 一个箱子. When she died, her family opened the chest and discovered hundreds of poems. We don't know the order in which she wrote them. We don't know the order of the little books. In each book, we know the order, but between the books, we don't know which ones go first, which ones go next. Even worse, recent scholarship has found that Emily Dickinson probably had an affair with her brother's wife, which of course, again, is something that society at that time did not accept. For most of literary history, people said that Dickinson had a very close friendship with her brother's wife. Uh, but recently we have discovered that many of her uh, collected poems have been changed and altered by, um, what was it? Her brother's wife's sister. It's, it's a complicated story. Uh, but anyways, you know, Dickinson's dead. She discovers that maybe Dickinson was writing love poems to her sister. To, um, you know, I should, do I have to draw a diagram? You know, so basically like um, this woman could not accept that Dickinson loved another woman and so erased her name the lover's name from the poems, changed her to him. Many of Dickens' poems were altered in this way. Uh, and so when you read a collection of Dickens and poetry, it is very important to check which edition. Is it earlier or is it more recent? Uh, some of the earlier editions even changed the dashes, changed the line arrangements, the whole scholarship on Dickinson poetry is very complicated. Um, so, in fact, some of the poems are have brackets around the numbers, which means that the poem has been changed and hopefully the editor tried to correct it in some way. Um, not any of the three poems I chose. The three poems I chose uh, are pretty settled. Um, so the language of these poems, you will probably recognize every word, but when you put them together, it will take some thinking. What is she trying to say? Okay, do you have questions about Dickinson? All right, so have fun reading these poems. I will see you next week.